Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And um, in case you're in the wrong place, this is Mega Melbourne. We'll be having a conversation about Mega Melbourne, where to from here. And we've got a lovely set of panelists here to talk about where we're heading. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Eyal Halamish. I'm the CEO of Arce. Arce.org is a website that allows uh, people to go online, they post questions, they vote for questions, and we get the top questions answered by community leaders like CEOs and politicians in our communities. Tonight, we wanted to um, turn to our panel and have a bit of a conversation that's going to be fairly open. We'll start off with uh, an introduction from uh, a counselor who's here, and then maybe just getting into the mix of things up on, on the panel. But I really want to turn it over to you and understand um, the questions that you have and get them uh, to, the, to the panel. And just before we get started, I want to do a quick straw poll. How many people here were born and bred and Melbourneites through and through? Oh, we got a good show of hands. How many people have only lived in, you know, were born somewhere else but moved to Melbourne? Wow, I actually got more. So this is, it's almost a testament in the room. How many of them wish that they were born somewhere else? And <laughs> one of the, nobody, everyone's glad to be here now. That's good. Well, I think, you know, it's, it shows really where, um, where Mel, what Melbourne is about and how it's growing so quickly that even a majority of the people in the room here came from other places. I myself am from uh, the city of Chicago and came here and it's odd that I was asked to talk about Melbourne, the city that I know maybe the least about. So before we get started, I wanted to ask uh, Councillor Ken Ong, who's here, to say a few words to the crowd. Councillor Ken Ong is a businessman who's been a community volunteer for about 20 years. He's a, he's a champion of words, and he already told me he wanted to waffle a little bit before we started, so I'll hand it over to him. Thank you, Al, and uh, fellow panelists here, panel from Rob, Rob Adams from the city of Melbourne. We call him our city genius. And Alan, who is uh, looking into the environment and looking after the environment, and of course, Jadam, who's from the music and the details, I guess Al will uh, introduce you guys more. It's a great pleasure to be here for tonight. Tonight, the topic is mega Melbourne. As I said before, Melbourne is not really mega. I was recently over in China at a city development conference in Chongqing. It's 31 million people, right? That is super mega. And it seems that in the next 25 years, there'll be at least 20 cities in the world that are considered mega cities, cities of over 20 million people. So we still have a very livable city here in Melbourne. As uh, Al said, Many of us have come from overseas or born in other places, and we have come to Melbourne and we have called it home. Why? Because it's such a great city. It's a great city because people with foresight 20 odd years ago decided to change the city from a very quiet donut city where everyone leaves once work's over. And now people live in the city and enjoy the city 24 hours a day. But as we continue to grow, we face challenges, and that's where tonight's conversation will be about. And I think, is that yours, Rob? Yeah. yeah, you see a handout on the table. Just show how Melbourne's spread out. And I think uh, one of the questions that you should ask is, what does the sprawl do to the city? And that, on that note, I finished my little introduction. I hope you all enjoyed tonight and asked many questions. I didn't get away the last time I was here, so I hope they don't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Ken Ong. So as Ken's already spoken about our wonderful panel here, um, I'll introduce them in a second. But before I introduce them, I'm going to get them each to tell us uh, what Melbourne means to them. And then we'll talk a bit about where Melbourne is heading. And I was thinking the best way to, what's a good way to introduce us to Melbourne? And I tried to find a poem. And I like this poem because it talks about, um, it talks about the city that I'm from and it compares it to Melbourne in the poem. And it also talks a lot about people who come and travel through this town, which is something that I originally was doing when I decided to stay for a while. So I'll, I'll read it to you. So it's a poem about Melbourne by Kevin Bymere, who's 25 years old. Six men flew in from different towns and several different lands to get a taste of Melbourne with their very eyes and hands. But each experience differed much from any other man's. A flagstaff tram to Parliament brought one with open awe, clean streets for eyes, fresh airs for lungs, a market for the jaw, I say, he said, this town of Melbourne's much like Ottawa. Baboom, said two in Brooklyn drawl. It's all within a week, a walk. Museums, restaurants, theaters, and nightclubs after dark. I say, he said, this town of Melbourne's very much like New York. 
While strolling through the scraper's hive, three thoughts were lost in fog. Oh, I don't, I don't, got, I don't got teams like bulls or bears, but demons and bulldoggos? I say, he said, this town of Melbourne's very like Chicago. It rains and rains each day and night. I'd hate to be a roofer, but Asian food galore, said four, to gulp down like a hoover. I say, he said, this town of Melbourne's very like Vancouver. Once five had won the pokies till, his wallet would fit, would fit. He hopped board a tram St. Kilda bound to stroll down beaches gritty. I say, he said, this town of Melbourne's like Atlantic City. There's neighborhoods and local pubs for getting bloody stunned in, but fish and chips without the grease. Six pondered this conundrum. I say, he said, this town of Melbourne's very much like London. They met again when heading home to talk about each site. They disagreed on every point and fought into the night. Though each had different answers, they were all completely right. So I thought we'd... <laughs> Those are mine. No, no applause necessarily. That was not my, my work of wisdom at all. But um, I thought we'd turn over to the panel and um, ask them about their story um, at Melbourne and what Melbourne means to them. And to introduce them, Jed and Comerford is a... Uh, a 27-year-old music media mogul, if you will. He, um, he started Boomtown Records in 2004 while studying and has since gone on to become one of Australian music industry's well-known personalities through his passion for music, conversation, business, and the odd cheeky pint of beer. Co-founding the stable group with Ben Turnbull in 2006, Jaden has a long shared a vision of creating a company that suggests a new model for the ailing music industry and executing it to perfection. I think uh, Jadon is someone who's really trying to redefine this music industry and um, has done a very good job. And it's kind of the beat behind uh, the music culture which you see in Melbourne. It's very rare that we get the opportunity to hear from uh, someone who's kind of behind the scenes and moving things left and right. We also have Ellen Sandell, who's the National Director of the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. She previously was the General Manager and Victorian Director of AYCC, and she's seen the growth of AYCC from a small group of passionate individuals to uh, 65,000 members strong across the nation. We've seen uh, the AYCC do some amazing work in uh, mobilizing uh, young people in schools and just outside of school to influence their policymakers around the area of climate change. And um, I've got a bunch of stuff written here, but I know that Ellen speaks a lot in the media and she's got a lot of uh, great ideas and we look forward to hearing her insights today. And finally, we have the designer, Rob Adams. Rob is the, um, the director of city design in the city of Melbourne. He's one of the champions of urban design and um, he said to me on the phone today that he's been thinking about this for at least 40 years, if not more. <laughs> and um, he got an order of Australia for uh, the great work that he's done in urban design and really thinking about this city through and through. So um, he'll probably provide us with some insights about what he sees happening, what he's seen happen, and where we might be heading in the future. So I'll turn it over to you, Jadon. What does Melbourne mean to you? Um... Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I guess I was just thinking about it then because I haven't had that much time to prepare, but I came up with the phrase in my head then that I'm basically one of those Melbourne idiots. So what I mean by that is I was born in Heidelberg and as soon as I was born, my dad put a Collingwood football jumper on me. Um, and heading to school over in Turak, uh, I would have to catch a train past Victoria Park and all I ever said to myself was one day I'm going to live near, near that place. I moved out of home to Abbotsford, right next to Victoria Park. And then six years later, um, a, few week, a few months ago, I bought a house in Collingwood and now I live there. So I haven't really moved far. I, I, um, I travel overseas a lot. I'm in New York and LA very regularly uh, and I've done some extensive travel through India to basically you know, uh, find my, myself. But uh, in terms of Melbourne, uh, it means a lot to me because it's the place that always just made sense for me and I always really enjoyed... I guess I started with that football culture and as, as I grew up and got into music, things started to become more about the, the, you know, the bars and the bands and the, all the different things that you can see. And now living in a place like Collingwood, uh, I have no excuse not to see live music. I can walk... I can, I can go home from work, have dinner, walk to the Tote or walk to the Evelyn or walk to Yaya's or walk to anywhere or you know, get a cab to the corner or go into the hi-fi or all these great places and you can see all these great bands. My favourite thing to do in Melbourne after eating somewhere is seeing as many gigs as I can in one night. So you can basically come to the TOF and see a singer, you know, solo artist. You can then 
head down to the hi-fi and catch a hip-hop artist and then head over to billboards and see a heavy metal band and then head down to one of the clubs and see a dubstep DJ and then, you know, things kind of get a little bit crazy after that. But, you know, I know you can do that in other places around the world, but that, to me, is a really exciting thing. And in between all that, you can eat this amazing food and meet these great people and get around relatively... Well, get around easily and relatively cheaply uh, and then make it home to Collingwood, um, you know, later that night. So, yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of my my thing with Melbourne. That's great. Hopefully we all can manage those late night benders the way that you've been able to to enjoy it as much as you have. What about you, Ellen? Okay. This is quite embarrassing, but when AL told me that I had to talk about what Melbourne means to me, I wrote a poem. Here we go. I'm 12 years old, sitting on the Tullamarine Freeway, dead still. It takes hours to get anywhere in this city. We crawl past the Melbourne Cemetery on the way to my grandfather's house. Dead centre of Melbourne, my dad jokes. We groan. Our groans turn to awe as we roll through suburbs named after our favourite football teams. My first school trip to the city. Keep your bags close. Don't talk to strangers. People are different in the city. Ding, ding, where's that coming from? Watch out. Underground at the Melbourne Uni Medical School lab, we're shown lungs in jars. Pink and healthy, this is a country lung. Grey and spotty, a city lung. Kids take an hour to get home from school on the train in this city. And it's cold, so damn cold. I tell myself, I am never moving to Melbourne. I'm 15 years old. My best friend has a tongue ring. She shuns fashion instead ops for up shopping. Driving through St Kilda, we're advised to lock up car doors and wind up the windows. We play a game, first one to spot a prostitute. The thrill, there are no prostitutes in our town. Our purple hair and checkered pants are enough to draw judging stares. Not in Melbourne. We reckon you could walk down the street naked and no one would care. This is the city. We could belong here. She turns to me. I can't wait to move to Melbourne. I'm 27 years old, flying down Flemington Road on my bicycle, the parrots, parrots are making a racket. They're louder than the cars, just the way it should be, a little piece of Australiana in a concrete savannah. My rebellious teenage purple hair is long gone, replaced by hipster yoga and brekkie at small block with my bestie. We head out to dumplings for lunch. $10 buys you the best Chinese food outside China, I've been told. It's true. They even throw in more than one rendition of Happy Birthday over the loudspeaker to make you feel welcome. I love the sounds of this city. They have become the sounds of me. The impatient ding of trams, frustrated they have nothing more at their disposal than a cheerful bell. The booming final siren of a game at the G and my shock at the emotion it always unearths. The fragments of indecipherable languages overheard on the train home. They're the good. There's also the bad. The sounds of cars whooshing past freeway sound walls, hiding cookie-cutter McMansions with matching unused tennis courts. The impending doom of a B-dub approaching from behind when you have nothing to protect yourself but a feeble fluoro bike vest. You curse bad city planning. <laughs> the infuriatingly cheerful ding before the announcement that your train has been cancelled. We have a love-hate relationship, this town and I. Why on earth would you want to live in Melbourne, my 12-year-old self says. Why on earth would you live anywhere else, I reply. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. I like the direct attack on Rob. That was very good. Oh. <laughs> Hard to follow. What does Melbourne mean to me? Um, I arrived here in 1983 with uh, driving down in a VW van with two children, uh, a wife and $2,000, and I was coming to my first job. Uh, having... Uh, left Zimbabwe uh, age 35 and my job was to come and help write a strategy for the city and uh, I've got to tell you I was terrified. When I arrived uh, the thing that struck me is that people in Melbourne care and not only do they care they participate and my best friend in Zimbabwe who was an Australian paediatrician said live anywhere except Melbourne in Australia. So. That was the introduction. The caring that I saw was within a few weeks of arriving here, a lady called Mieta phoned me up and said, um, would I come for dinner? And I didn't even know who Mieta was. 
And I went to one of the councillors and said, uh, I've had this invitation for dinner and I, I didn't want to do the wrong thing. Uh, so they said, no, you should go. And uh, we went along and met Mieta and she had eight or ten people there she thought I should meet. And uh, the most incredible generosity that people like Mieta, and I think a lot of Melburnians have, to bring people into the city and make it part of them is what I love. And I think that uh, I've often said, uh, you know, what uh, city in the world gets 80,000 people turning up to a club match? Uh, I reckon you could put on a game of tiddlywinks and 3,000 people would turn up. <laughs> and, and, you know, just talking to Jeff Taylor tonight, he's in the 11th year of his conversation, and uh, this is the third time he's done in this venue. And he said, I'm not sure how many people we get, maybe 25. That's why I love Melbourne. You turn up, you care, and you value your city. And I think uh, that's an incredibly rich asset that any city can have. And I think it speaks volumes for the people of Melbourne. Absolutely. Thanks for that. I think, give, give him a round of applause. I think as, as you were speaking, Ellen, I thought of one of my colleagues um, who grew up in, in the country, Victoria, was talking about when he used to come into town and he was very scared growing up because his dad always said to him, you know, watch out for those, those punks in the city. You know, they'll, they'll stab you. You know, and he would come in and to, to do some trading or to, you know, to sell some of the, the livestock that they were raising. And um, he was always just scared of speaking to people on the train because they had pink hair. And um, now people are scared about the hipsters in town, you know. So it sounds like you've become the person that you... <laughs> but nonetheless, I think, you know, and as I was thinking about tonight, I, you know, what, what is Melbourne about? I spoke to a couple of people on, um, in the RSA team and also other people who are more familiar with Melbourne than I am. And they talked about a bit of the history of Melbourne and how, you know, at one point um, it, was, it was marvelous Melbourne. You know, we had a gold rush just around the corner and suddenly this was one of the richest cities in the Commonwealth. In fact, maybe the richest city in the Commonwealth and one of the largest cities after, after London. And um, there was a point where we went through the Industrial Revolution. We saw Melbourne, which was marvelous, became Smelbourne, right? Because we had this industrial stink coming out of this town, which was very much in line with a lot of major towns around um, the world. But now that we're here, we know what we're about. I was wondering, Rob, if you could maybe tell us, you know, from your perspective, you've kind of been looking at the city as it's progressed, and what are some of the tensions, or the, the pressures that we're seeing um, as Melbourne becomes mega? We shift from four million plus to to what we're talking about is a five million or even, even greater. And uh, one of the reasons why we love coming to the city is because it gives us a bit of space. When you come from other major cities, there's not that much space to walk around and you're trying to see if you can get across the street before somebody else you know, snubs you. But here, there's, there's a bit more space. So what are the pressures and the tensions that we see? I think, uh, and I've just dropped on some of the tables, uh, a study there. It's a vampire study out of Griffiths University and it's uh, the vulnerability to mortgage and, uh, and petrol prices. And I think one of the biggest tensions we're facing at the moment in Melbourne is that cities like Melbourne that grew up uh, on the back of the motor car can do that to a certain stage and they're successful. But when you get too big, uh, you start to choke yourself. And that diagram that shows you there between 2001 and 2006 basically shows you the people in the city who are starting to suffer. Not because they haven't got good jobs, um, but the cost of living far removed from their, their, their workplace. On an average, a lot of the people living on the fringe are paying 50% of their income to cover their mortgage and their travel to work. And the city's starting to choke on that. Um, and I suppose the tension that I feel is that cities are going to carry on expanding. We know that the urban population of the world is going to double in the next 50 years. We know that cities chug out 70% to 80% of the greenhouse gases, and they're responsible for 70 to 80% of the GDP. So if we can't start to design cities that are, are sustainable, then we've got a, a, a really uphill battle against the, the whole climate change issue. And what frustrates me a little bit is that I don't see any policy at the moment coming from the federal government uh, or for that matter, the state government, that is trying to address this issue. In fact, to the contrary. We see more land being you know, subdivided on the periphery when we've already got a 25-year supply of land on, on, on the fringe of the city. Uh, and we see no realisation of the fact that the demographics of our cities have changed. We've got much, much well, in the paper today, we one of the younger cities. But there is this big population bulge coming through of 60-year-olds. And maybe they don't want to live on the fringe. 
and family sizes on average are 2.1. So why do we want four bedroom houses on the fringe with uh, all the energy and space they take? So we're not, we're not watching the trends. We're not watching the trends and actually looking at them and saying, what are they telling us? Uh, there's more family violence on, on, on the fringe areas. Uh, bankruptcies at the moment on the fringe areas. So we've got a divided city. You could almost draw a medieval wall around that piece of green in the middle and we've got two cities that are operating. And I think that's a very dangerous position to be in, both socially, financially and um, environmentally. So that's the biggest tension. If we don't start to come to grips with what we have to do to turn that round, then I think we're in a perilous situation. And I suppose... For me, the irony is that the solution, to a certain extent, is staring us in the face. Uh, we see more people on bikes. Uh, we, we see uh, four or five-storey uh, dwellings going up along tram lines and bus routes. And we've seen cities like Glasgow that have turned themselves back on themselves and through that concentration have become healthy, vibrant cities. And I think that's where we need to go. And so that is our biggest single, single challenge. We've seen the centre of Melbourne improved from 1983 when we first uh, arrived here to what it is today, I think it's possible to do that with a whole metro area, to give it an energy back that would make it a really vibrant uh, city. But we won't do it by continual expansion. Is there, I mean, for the people out here, is there something that, you know, as individuals, we can do around that in order to accelerate that? Well, I, I, I think uh, there is. Uh, already you can see recognition within the development fraternity uh, as, as to where development's going. Uh, last year, 50% of the starts were units uh, rather than detached houses. So the market has already turned. Um, if we could start to talk about the things we value in our city, the accessibility, the ability to go to all the clubs that we've heard about, um, the proximity to what cities are about. The cities are our cities because we like socially to mix with people and to inter interact with people. You don't do that at 60 miles an hour or 60 kilometres an hour on a freeway or, you know, you know stuck, uh, you know, far out on the fringe. So if we can start to talk to people about the fantastic lifestyle of living in a city and, 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 and sell it as something positive, uh, then I think people would actually look at the other solutions. And it's not an either or. It's just we've maybe, maybe got enough suburbia. We don't need any more. And um, we've seen that, we saw that happen in 93 when we first promoted coming and living in the city. And I was told Australians don't live in the city. Well, offer them the unit, offer them the opportunity, let them make the choice themselves. And suddenly we, we have more units in the city, uh, you know, than people think is healthy. So I think we've just got to get out there and start selling the, the what I think is the delight of living in close proximity with your fellow citizens and where the street is the major public space of the city. It's not for cars. It is 80% of the public realm. You design a good street, you design a good city. But it's for people. That's great. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a greenie at heart, and I'm hearing some, some greenie waves coming out of there, you know, and I'm looking for truck-sized bike lanes, you know. The other day I got hit by Somebody opened a car door straight into me, knocked me off my bike, and I thought, oh, man, if this was just a couple centimeters wider, I'd be okay right now. But uh, Ellen, so, you know, this is very much in your stream of thinking and, you know, do you think, is, is Rob on the right track and also are we doing okay or should we, do we need to go faster or where are we at? I completely agree with everything that Rob said. I don't think that Melbourne is a city, really. It's a whole bunch of suburbia with a little city in the middle and when I think about, I grew up in Mildura and the things that frustrated frustrate me about living in Melbourne that I can get in Mildura is the ease of getting around and you can get anywhere in five minutes literally um, with a car and I just think there is nowhere I can get in Melbourne in five minutes whatsoever and um, I think that I am definitely willing to give up having a quarter acre block to actually be able to get places um, and I think that that has incredible benefits for our lifestyle, um, not just for the environment. I think the environmental benefits flow on, but it's, it does frustrate me that there are these things that will directly benefit our lives. And I think that you asked about, well, what can we do? And I'm going to be a bit controversial because I was told we need to have a little bit of a debate. Um, I would say vote out the state government because I think that not necessarily, you know, I'm not making a comment about this state government in particular, but <laughs> I think that if you look at the planning decisions that 
govern the way we live our lives. 95% of them are, are controlled, or almost 100% of them controlled by the state government. And you can have incredible local governments like the city of Melbourne who does incredible things to try and make their city more livable, but they're always ultimately constrained by, by the state government. And when the state government says, we're scrapping the entire bike budget or we're going to open up all these green spaces for just developments with no transport and no trees and no social infrastructure, we need to look at that and say, well, we need to do something about that and I think that has to be a political solution. So let's, uh, let's get City Council to manage the whole thing, right? <laughs> well, but potentially there have been instances where that's, you know, where that has been better, you know, the, I can't remember what the principle's called, but subsidiarity, where, you know, you try and get government closest to the people and I think that potentially that's a lot of city councils are doing a better job than the state government at managing livability of our cities. It might be a cyclical thing. I mean, we used to have city-states and, and uh, when you look at uh, what's driving the economy of nations, quite often it's centred around cities. So... Uh, you know, I think uh, there might be a pattern that basically says, uh, and this will be controversial, you don't vote out the state government, you get rid of the state government. You know, if you had federal and, and regional government, you'd mostly have enough levels of government. Now, I know it's not going to happen, um, and I'll mostly get wrapped on the knuckles for having said it, but, you, you know, it worries me that uh, cities have been relegated to the, the lower levels of government, Federal governments don't have a minister for cities. Albanese will say he's a minister for cities, but he's actually infrastructure. And his vision of infrastructure is big stuff. You know, four billion dollars, photograph it from five kilometers. So, you know, I think we've got to start to get all levels of government involved in the city and the health of the city. And start to think about what drives the economy of our countries and the planet. Uh, and, and at the moment, uh, it is cities. 8% of GDP goes into residential, 2% in the coal mine. It's, you know, there's, were you going to say something? I just want to say I love the thing that you said about roads, because um, I, I rang up a friend of mine who's a councillor in the city, and I said, what should I say tonight? And he said, it's all about the roads. Like you said, it's 80% of the public space. Why can't we just cut every single road in half? Half the roads in the city could be one way. Then they don't need to be through traffic. And I was thinking, actually, most of the roads that I've ever lived on don't need to be through traffic. Um, cut it in half, you could have one row of parking, a single lane, and then the rest could be a park. You could just plant grass there. And I was thinking, you know, that's a pretty radical idea. But when you think that it's incredible public space that's being wasted there, um, and you could do something with that. It's not that radical, because if you think of the road as a piece of real estate, and if you were a property developer and looking at a piece of road, and you had to get the most out of it, the last thing you put on it was a motor car. It is actually the least efficient way of using that piece of real estate. You know, uh, you go from, you know, peds to bikes to public transport before you get anywhere near the car. And, and there was a chap giving us a talk the other night and he said, uh, a car travelling at 60 kilometres an hour takes about 200 times the space of a bicycle. Mm. You know, so it's an incredibly inefficient way. So maybe not one-way streets, I'm not found in one way, but I think, you know, let's start reimagining our streets. Yeah, I, I mean, I am a little concerned. Sometimes people like the dream of just riding in your car and putting on that music and enjoying a cruise through the city to see what it feels like, and so we might be losing some of that nostalgia. But you can have that, because most roads aren't that. You would still have those roads. So if you look at somewhere like North Melbourne, you have King Street, you have Curzon Street, which are the through you know, lanes, and you can get anywhere you need to go on those streets, but then every street that is a residential street beyond those, you can't get through, through there on your car. You've got to park and then get out. And most, most streets are for nothing but accessing your house. So you definitely can do that to most streets. So I'm here, there's a, you know, you're talking a little bit about how we're, we're fringing the city or we don't really have this good move towards a centralised city. And maybe, you know, could that be something good? I don't know if, Jed, and you've been to a couple other places around the world and even looking at different music cultures. Is this, you know, this, you know the boroughs that are forming around Melbourne, is that a good thing? Um, and also you talked about this idea of, you know, you can jump from bar to bar and get, you know, a diversity. Does it breed greater diversity or is it actually better to have that stronger concentration and building up rather than building out? Yeah, well, I, look, 
I'll, I'll, uh, I'm a little bit out of my depth tonight, to be honest. Uh, I'm, I'm not a very political person, so uh, I'm actually learning a lot tonight, so this is really good, thank you. Um, you used the word borough. Uh, makes me think of New York, obviously. Um, you know, the boroughs of New York are, you know, five very amazing uh, places, but at the same time, you know, even within those boroughs, there's some pretty horrible things. You know, Brooklyn is where all the hipsters are, and there's some great bars and venues and stuff like that, but if you go too far into Brooklyn, well, just don't go too far into Brooklyn, you know, like... Um, it's interesting because a friend of mine lives in one of those four bedroom houses out in the, the you know, in the, I won't say where, but he said to me the other night, I said, when are you going to uh, move into town so we can actually meet up for dinner midweek? Because he lives like an hour drive away. And he said, well, he read a study that in 10 years time, where he lives is going to be the ghetto. So he needs to sell his house and come into town. And it was really interesting because I hadn't really thought about that. I just live in inner city because I love living in a city for the reasons I explained. But it's, uh, it's interesting to be here tonight to actually discuss that issue. Um, in terms of uh, like the music industry and the suburbs, uh, there's a huge history there. So a lot of the older agents and managers in the music industry always talk about the suburbs because that's where they broke bands like Men at Work and ACDC, like playing the, the Furniture Gully Hotel and the Hallam Hotel and all these kinds of venues, which uh, they have their place for certain acts, like the Angels have a great time doing gigs in places like that. Um, but there's not really the population out there of younger people to go and see that kind of music, because I guess now I'm here thinking about this stuff, we're all living in the city, um, or we're all living around the city, besides my mate who's living in the ghetto. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I think that I definitely think that you know focusing on building a better city is 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 a is a good thing. I, I can't see it as a bad thing. Do you think also maybe just a bit more about the music industry? We talked about cost of living being a bit, being a bit more expensive, and even the music industry's um, it's gone through its waves. You know, we've had new technology actually transforming the way the music industry functions. Um, what does it mean for Melbourne, and how does Melbourne become like you said? It could be the music capital of the of the world, if not just Australia. For sure. Well, yeah, everyone, often people ask me how is the GFC affecting the music industry right now? It's like, well, the music industry got hit way before the GFC came. You know, when, as, soon as, people, as soon as people got their first CD burner, that's when everything changed. Um, but the music industry is in a great place right now. Uh, digital music has just passed physical music in terms of average sales. And the actual recorded music sector in Australia is now growing uh, rather than declining as it has for like the last seven or eight years. That's just a side note, but it's time to be positive again. And also keep buying music on iTunes. Thank you very much. Um, and subscribe to Spotify. Um, I don't work for either of those services, but I think the inner city getting stronger will only help the venues and that get stronger. There's been the obvious issue over the last uh, year and a half of the closure of venues for multiple reasons. I don't really want to go into that topic because there's a million different ways you can dissect that issue. Um, but I think better understanding of a growing city and a younger, well, not even a younger demographic, but just a overall uh, want and need to live in the city, I think will only help strengthen the music business. Uh, there's a really great organisation that's formed out of the, the music issue that happened around the tote, uh, Music Victoria, who are uh, pursuing a lot of different initiatives in terms of soundproofing venues and providing different things and accesses to venues that are going to help musicians and then in turn help the communities around the venues and basically just make it a better place and make it easier for everybody. Can I'm going to turn to the audience in a sec, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to turn to the audience for a question in a sec, but Ellen, Can go. I ask you a question? You give me the first question. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm interested as to where innovation in music comes from because I read this interesting article yesterday that Adelaide is going to be the next Seattle in terms of grunge came out of Seattle and there was this yeah. incredible innovation because it was just the right size city and that they think Adelaide is really comparable to that because it's very, it's big enough, but small enough, sure. if, if that makes sense. And I'm wondering, in a place like, obviously so much innovation happens in a place like New York, where does innovation happen in Melbourne? If we're not Adelaide, we're not New York. Sure. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with you about Adelaide, but I'm not going to agree with you, um, <laughs> with all due respect to that lovely little city. But... Innova the, the music industry has always been starved for innovation because the music industry for so many years has been ruled and governed by the major record companies, which are multinational corporations that don't really... Uh, they're, they're not entrepreneurial, and I think that innov innovation in the music industry comes out of entrepreneurs. The age of 
you know, piracy essentially has changed the music industry and forced the music industry to be innovative again. Because for so long, they, uh, the music industry made its money out of selling recorded music. So it started with vinyl. And, and you know, CDs were just like a gold mine. I mean, we used to pay like $30 for a CD. Uh, those things cost like a dollar to make. Like those companies were killing it. I wish I was 15 years earlier. Um, but yeah, so I think innovation comes from from change and from like the uh, like now that we have Spotify because of piracy, and Spotify is one of the greatest things that's ever happened to the music industry. But I think Melbourne is the music capital of Australia. It's the live music capital of Australia. Sydney is where all the the corporate entities are, the majors, the media companies. Melbourne is where the exciting companies are. Um, Michael Gudinski, who is you know one of the you know, the heads of the Australian music industry is in Melbourne, his company is in Melbourne. A lot of the greatest, great managers in Australia are from Melbourne and have always been from Melbourne. My company's in Melbourne. Hopefully that's a good thing. Melbourne's the place to be, it really is. I heard that um, someone said to me once that it used to be easier to steal music than it was to actually buy it legally. And then recently we've started to see that shift. So Napster was actually kind of, you know, it was easier to go on Napster and download something illegally than it was to actually mm. buy something straight off. Now know. it's easier to buy it and that's why people are buying it. And that's what the music industry, it took Apple to come and sort the music industry out because the music industry wasn't listening to the consumers. As I said, it, the change, the innovation comes from the consumers. And I think on the Melbourne and Sydney comparison, I think we know who won. Um, but uh, someone once said to me that, you know, Sydney is the place that you, uh, you date for a weekend and Melbourne's the one that you marry for a lifetime. Let's, let's hope that's, that's correct. I wanted to open it up to the, to the audience if there's any questions. I see one right here. Why assume we have to grow because of certain, and that's the other question, why talk about one city rather than a multiplicity of villages? And, and the other question is food security. I mean, maybe going down the track, living on the fringe might be an actual advantage if you've got the internet and, and your work uh, globally without having to come into the city. I mean, the assumptions that we have to bring all that energy into the inner city seems to me is questionable. And so, those there's are my issues. Look, I, th I think uh, they, they all actually, uh, three very good questions and interrelated. Um, when I talk about cities growing, I'm talking about a, a worldwide trend of urbanisation. And, and why I think that's good is because, uh, sadly, I'm old enough to remember when Future Shock was written, and we talked about how populations were growing. And we, we've been through the transistor radio, and we've been through you know, one children families. The one thing that actually reduces the family size is when people arrive in cities. And, and they get opportunity and uh, access to new skills. So um, if we're going to control a global uh, population, I think the one thing that is likely to do that is urbanization. And it's happening. So uh, I don't assume cities have to grow, uh, what I notice is that they, they're tending to grow and, and there's, a, there's a positive out of that. You know, what if we could have five or six Adelaides within Melbourne? And, and uh, I think what we saw in Melbourne uh, with things like the 2030 plan was really very good. Uh, in fact, a study we did recently, which that uh, uh, article comes out of, basically said you could double the population of Melbourne, put it in 7.5% of the metro area. And that would be around railway stations, along your major public transport, uh, road-based public transport, trams and, and buses, and in your redevelopment sites, which means you wouldn't have to touch suburbia. So it's a sort of a win-win. Suburbia come, becomes the new green lung. It's where you collect your water, generate photovoltaics, plant more trees. So I get excited about what we could do with Melbourne, and I think it is a group of villages rather than a, you know, this large centre with things coming into them. So I think that you know, really uh, is, is part of our solution. The trouble was implementing it. 2030 was good. They never got around to implementing it. I think that that's what you'd see in many of the great cities that we think of. So I just had a new housemate move into my house and she's from Berlin. And I was asking her, you know, what do you love about Melbourne versus what do you love about Berlin? And the first thing she said was, in Berlin, each suburb has its own identity and you could live entirely in one suburb and you would get everything that you need. In Melbourne, I'm constantly having to come in or kind of the inner north. Um, and so, you know, everybody loves Berlin, right? We could become more like that. I'm, I'm, try I'm hoping that someday someone will ask me where you're from and I'll say I'm a Brunswickian, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see if that comes into fruition. Do you, um, is there a city that we should look to as a, as a model for this city? 
Look, I think there are a number of cities we can look to. Uh, I mean, we can look to Glasgow about a city that turned itself around by coming back in on itself. Uh, we can look to Bordeaux in terms of a city that has got this fantastic quality of public realm. You know, trams without overhead rails, single rail, rail down the middle and induction, you know, great public spaces. Uh, we could look to Malmo that, uh, you know, built a, almost a zero emissions piece of urbanism and showed us what the future looked like. And surprise, surprise, it wasn't frightening. And it, it wasn't, you know, 100 metres tall either. It was five or six storeys and quite compact. Um, you could look to Bogota and see where they actually spent on social infrastructure, schools, parks, you know, libraries. Uh, so there, there are many cities we can learn from, I think. Um, but the important thing is we don't lose our own character. Let's not try and look like them. Let's always try and feel like Melbourne. But, uh, you know, maybe take a few lessons from how other cities have turned themselves around. Jaden, is it the same for um, with music? Is there a music, you know, other music capital we should be looking at, or is there something really magical about this place that's going to push us beyond that? No, there is something magical about Melbourne, definitely. Like there are, you know, there's great cities around the world, but they've all got their own problems. Uh, America's the American music industry is a mess um, uh, in terms of live music and the way the promoters are operating and venues are owned by multinational companies and it's all the multinational uh, problems in, in the music industry. But no, we have lots of venues. We have lots of people wanting to go to the venues. Most, A lot of the venues are full a lot of the time. Uh, we don't always sell the most tickets in Melbourne, but our shows in Melbourne always sell out first because people are just so keen and eager to, to buy tickets. So I think we're doing pretty well. Corporate greed wins again. Is there... Um... Can I just make a comment about Bogota as well? I think that's the other thing my friend said, who's a councillor. I said, which city should we be like? And he said, the reason why Bogota got all this incredible social infrastructure, and I don't know much about it, so correct me, um, was because they had such an incredible problem with transport and a lot of people are you know, living below the poverty line in Colombia and somebody came to the mayor or whoever it was, the city planner, and said, it will cost you this much and we're going to build this incredible highway and this incredible road network. He looked at it and said, OK, thank you very much. Go away. I'm going to take all that money. I'm not going to spend it on the road. I'm going to spend it on schools. I'm going to spend it on hospitals and I'm going to spend it on bikes because people can afford to ride bikes and people can't afford to drive cars. And I just thought that was great. I felt like if someone came to our government and said... You know, here's, here's what it'll cost to build a road. Maybe they'd either just save that money or they'd sp spend it on something else. But he actually spent exactly the same amount of dollars that he saved on the road on social infrastructure. Yeah, it was Enrique Penaloza. And uh, his, his vow when he came into office was, I will not spend a single dollar in my term on the motor car. Mm -hmm. And he kept it. You know, and he lived to tell the story, which is not bad in Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. And I'd like, I'd like to... Yeah. This is a bit cheeky and ridiculous, but has anyone been to Minneapolis? You know how it's so cold in Minneapolis? They have all those, um, like, one or two storeys up. You can get between all the buildings. You can walk from, like, one end of the town to the other just by going along these corridors, and people set up, like, coffee carts in there and stuff. We should do that in Melbourne, but with slides. And you can, like, slide from one building to another building from Melbourne Uni all the way down. Public slides. Awesome. I see a future here. Just, Carol? Yeah, hi. Um, firstly, on the issue of Melbourne Berlin, I have to say that my 19-year-old was in Berlin last year and she rang me up and she said, Mum, this city is almost as cool as Melbourne. So there you go. Um, but my question is to you, Rob. Um, how feasible do you think it is to get your vision around um, the planning for Melbourne actually happening? Because I know you've been talking about it for a while. Um, you know, about those four to five storey um, buildings on major transport routes, etc. I mean, how much longer do we have to talk about it and not do it? Uh, Carol, it, it, it's, uh, you know, and I'm obviously biased, it's incredibly feasible because it's happening. If you, if you go along those tram routes, you will see small scale developments of four or five storeys starting to pop up. Um, it would happen a lot faster if the uh, the planning schemes uh, encouraged it to happen. So if we, if, we, if we wanted to get that energy closer to the maximum number of people, and if we started to allow our, our high streets with you know, the trams and that running along to become you know, where our populations live, uh, it, I think it would be a bit like Postcode 3000. I mean, when we started Postcode 3000 uh, in the early 90s, 
It took us a couple of years to convince people that living in the city was the right thing to do. When the first bank, Macquarie Bank, did number one exhibition street, and it sold in about three months, suddenly we thought, actually that works. And I think we're on the cusp of that happening now. It would take next to nothing for the state government to say, look, in certain areas, let, let's have a very simple planning scheme. There are only two zones in the planning scheme. The areas where we don't want you to build, and, and they would be, I would argue, predominantly your existing residential areas, and the areas where we do want you to build. We want you to build close to public transport, uh, you know, in the redevelopment sites, and almost give as of right development, as long as you uh, build according to certain good urban design rules, uh, you know, active frontages, protecting the street, all the rest of it. I think if you did that and changed the planning scheme, psychologically developers will say, all right, we know where the development needs to be, and it would start to happen automatically. And the exciting thing for me is it would happen in small properties rather than big ones. Because uh, I'm a bit over big. I think, you know, big hasn't served us well, uh, both in our economies and, uh, you know, in our cities. And I think if all those small blocks were developed by some of the smaller builders, you'd suddenly see some very rich streets starting to emerge. And you can see that happening at the moment. I mean, you know, in streets like Brunswick Street, you go down, even the, the one that's been done by the state government on the edge of Athenton Gardens is, is a very good building and will have this active frontage, five or six storeys, and will add some energy back to the street. So I think it's going to happen. Uh, the question, will it happen with government planning assistance or despite it? I think that reminds me of um, when I was speaking to someone about Spain and how they have plazas as this general public space, but they're actually, the buildings that surround them are never ending. They keep growing and adding more and more buildings on top. So you also have different socioeconomic groups yeah. living on top of each other, next to each other, sleeping on top of each other. And um, it's, you know, maybe there's potential for us to turn the, the street into our, our plaza in the future. <laughs> So I'll hand it over to the next question asker. Hi, my name is Nick. Um, I'm going to throw something really radical out there. I think we do. We are developing. We are seeing the development of kind of boroughs where you know Thornbury has its own distinct character, just like Northcote does, just like Brunswick does, and Fitzroy and Carlton, and they're all starting to um, exhibit their own unique qualities, their own unique and diverse qualities. And this is happening without, you know, or in spite of kind of uh, state and, and governmental systems um, doing or not doing what may or may not be in the interests of people. People are doing these things themselves. Why wait for the state government or the federal government to start representing people's interests and what may or may not be in the collective benefit? And why not just go and do it ourselves? So D DIY Mem Melbourne, right? Do it yourself Melbourne. Um, I, I think I Rob, Rob would lose his, his career very quickly, but I don't know if we do it the right way. I think that you're absolutely correct, and but it's about facilitating that. So I think you see that places like Thornbury and Northcote develop that kind of culture, and of course it's grassroots and of course it's driven by the people, but it's been facilitated by what those places used to be. So, for example, you're not seeing so much of that in places like Deer Park or Craigieburn because there is still a lot of culture and I would say a lot of incredible stuff happening there, but it's not as easy and the kinds of people that innovate don't necessarily gravitate there. And so if you see somewhere like Berlin as an example, it, a lot of it was facilitated by not necessarily city planning, but the history of the place. So you had abandoned factories on the riverbank um, that had squatters in them that became these incredible, creative, innovative places because they were left as empty buildings because of the circumstances that Berlin was in. And so you do need to have places, like there's you know, empty fairgrounds that people took over and did incredible things with, but you, it's, it's hard to facilitate that if you're building you know, you know, sixths of an acre blocks that are all cookie cutter and you know, the planning scheme and just doesn't facilitate that kind of stuff, if that makes sense. So of course it comes from the people, but you can do things that facilitate it. So do, how do we trigger diversity? Jaden, is, is GarageBand going to save us? No, I actually really like what you said, and I probably didn't give enough credit to uh, the boroughs of Melbourne when I referenced the boroughs of Melbourne, because you're dead right. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the East Brunswick Club anymore. There's great venues there. Uh, Brunswick, Northcote, Thornbury, you know, North Melbourne. But what you're saying is completely right. Um, I work with a lot of hardcore bands and um, 
a lot of those bands come from that place of playing warehouses and there's a uh, a great place called Cat Food Press, which I'm sure you know, uh, on Ligon Street in Brunswick, which is just a shop front. And, you know, it's crazy stuff goes on there. Um, look, in terms of commenting on how we move that forward, I don't know. Um, I might suggest anarchy, um, but I don't even know if that's if I'm allowed to say that word here. But in terms of culture, it's amazing. And the, most of the artists that we all know that are now you know, our household names like Gautier and stuff like that. That's where those people started. So the more we can co uh, foster that kind of culture, the more success we're going to have as a, as a city. Rob, can we, can we design for cultural innovation and this diversity, or is it something that just kind of happens? I think you can. Um, you know, interestingly, uh, you know, City of Melbourne is actually putting out a street gardening policy. So people will be able to, you know, use their nature strips and their, you know, uh, medians and things like that. We've got sitting in the audience today uh, a lady, Eleni, who uh, designs for culture. You know, she got hold of a warehouse on the Maribyrnong and uh, for very little money, a couple of hundred thousand dollars, made art spaces for, you know, I'll mostly get the uh, figure wrong, but it was about 50 odd artists, and pe including people like Callum Morton who went in there. So um, I think we, we can actually design for innovation. And, and what it's about is actually getting spaces that aren't expensive, uh, that people can share. Uh, the Nicholas Building in, in Swanson Street is one of my favorite. There is a recipe for innovation. When you put that number of creative people you know, in one building, and, and, and you allow them to actually interact and, and, and meet each other, you, you get innovation. So uh, I think if you want to design for innovation, there are a few secrets. I think you need a certain density. Um, I think you need mixed use. Uh, you need good connectivity. You need to be able to get, you know, to places easily. And uh, if you start to get those ingredients coming in, uh, you'll get innovation. And, and what you need to reserve is some of the older stock. Uh, you know, we, we wonder about whether we should keep old buildings. It's not just about whether they're valued for their heritage or their social heritage, but it's their rental values as well. You know, places like this don't happen in, you know, modern buildings that have just been built. They happen because there's a certain rental structure that works in, in you know, recycled buildings and reusing buildings. So I think you can uh, design for innovation, and I think it's one of our big challenges uh, as we see a lot of new buildings going through. How do we keep the old stuff? How do we keep the grunge? How do we keep the real you know, life and energy of the inner city? It's very true. I, I actually um, work out of a building that's a very big open space. We don't design buildings that with such big open spaces anymore unless it's for a massive auditorium. And so um, we, it's called Hub Melbourne. And it feels like this massive brain of tiny brains all working off each other and feeding off each other and doing really cool things. And you always walk into the kitchen and hear some crazy new idea about turning balloons into golf balls and spaceships and whatnot. But but, I agree um, that you can over-engineer it as well, that you can't just design a space and then hope that innovation will happen. And design can actually squash innovation if you aren't leaving those places that people can squat in and... Um, I mean, I, I think the hub is great, but for our organisation, we could never have afforded to, live, to work out of the hub. So we went and found some, you know, old falling down building that had water coming in the roof, and that was perfect for us um, because we couldn't afford the hub because we weren't, you know, at that level or mature enough. So I think you can out design innovation. Out design the design. There's an interesting parallel between Berlin and Melbourne. If we look at where the energy of Melbourne comes, it's usually where things like the height limit have been kept in place. So there's a 40 metre height limit that runs through the middle of the city here. Mm. So we get the lanes, the arcades, the pubs, the clubs. It's the 40 metre height limit that uh, existed back in the 19th century because of the height of a fireman's ladder. Berlin is one of the cities that held on to its height limit, absolutely held on to it. Um, and you've just got a, a bit of tall stuff starting to happen now. And I think uh, there is a direct, in my mind, correlation between keeping the value of properties at a certain level that you allow the creative energy to remain in the centre of a city. And once you put infinite value on a piece of land, you know, you can build 100 storeys, you drive out that creative energy. Uh, absolutely convinced of that. And I think that's one of our challenges in central Melbourne over the next 10, 20, 20 years, that we don't actually destroy the stuff like this that we love. That's Kevin. There's a question in the, in the back. Look, in, in relation to what that gentleman said about what's happening in the inner suburbs or the inner middle middle suburbs, how do you make that exchange work in a new city in the future? Jaden, what do you reckon? How do we make it work? Mm. 
Um, I don't know. You, you left him hanging. Yeah, sorry. I didn't know it was for me, but my dad, uh, even though he we went for Collingwood, he used to hate Smith Street. He would always say, to her, as kids, never go to Smith Street. It's the worst place. And now his favourite place to have dinner is Ronnie Burns, uh, the Spanish pub on Smith Street. Um, but yeah, it's funny. Did you? Did anyone else? Did Rob? Did you want to say anything on that? Or look, not not a lot. I mean, it, it, there there is a change that occurs as parts of the city become gentrified, and I think that is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can see, you know, Ligon Street starts, and then you go, it flips over to Brunswick Street, and Brunswick Street's cool, and all the artists arrive, and then that becomes gentrified, and now people are moving to Smith Street. I think you do go through that process of gentrification, and, and streets will go through that. Um, just at the moment, in retail, Chapel Street uh, and Turek Road are, are suffering. If you look at them, you know, in terms of their retailing, um, th th they'll go through those cyclical trends. I think the the thing that worries me a bit is that they'll still always have an energy, and I believe they'll come back, uh, and, and they will have another life. I don't know quite what it'll be, but it'll be different. I can't see that energy coming back into some of the outer areas, particularly if we can't invest in the infrastructure that you need in those outer areas to make them exciting places to live. And, and with every step you go further, the cost of the infrastructure to go into the areas that already exist is huge. Um, there's a calculation that was done that said for every 1,000 houses you build on the fringe, it'll cost you $300 million more over 50 years than if you'd built those within the existing infrastructure. Mm. So we, what we're doing is we're actually making the problem harder for ourselves. We, we're pushing more houses, but not following the transport or the social facilities or the community facilities that those communities need. And, and uh, so we can argue about whether areas in the inner city change, uh, change and they do. And, and, and people like me most probably uh, affect them by moving into places like Brunswick Street. Mm. Uh, but that, that'll be a natural thing that happens. Uh, what I worry about is for your mate, you know, because what he'll find is, in fact, mostly the best time to sell his houses at a loss now, because it's going to get worse. Um, those houses are going down in value almost from the day that people have moved in. And it's because, not of the cost of the piece of land and property, but the cost of actually living out there. Um, you, have you been to Cadinia lately? I went out there the other day, I got agoraphobia, I tell you. It, it's so far out, you know, and I worry I, honestly, it's, I'm not making a joke of it. I actually worry about what communities do out there mm -hmm. to actually you know, engage with the wider community because it's so far away. It's sort of 54 kilometers away. Mm -hmm. At Absolutely. least it's got a train. Yeah. I just, we're going to have one more question and, uh, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, and I, I will encourage you to continue the questions afterwards, but I'm going to wrap up the event because there's a lot of people in here. It's getting pretty hot. Hi. Um, I've lived in North Fitzroy for 42 years um, in a $17,000 house. Um, and I've sell watched... Sell it, sell it now. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched my children grow up and have to try and get a foothold in the real estate market. I wanted to talk about issues to do with community housing because um, my retired husband's gone, gone onto the board of a community organisation. And it seems to me that when planning issues come up and when there's vacant land available, that we need to put a lot more emphasis on not-for-profit developments. There's too many profitable developments happening. Um, when I look at what's happening in the community sector, they seem to have better designs, more green buildings, um, and they're actually catering to a lot of disadvantaged people who would otherwise be pushed out into those red areas. How can we use more community developments and provide housing for people who can't afford to live in the city or in the inner suburbs? Anyone who wants to take that one? Uh, Canada does it very well. Uh, they, they've got a thing called inclusionary, inclusive rezoning, which means for every development, when they you know, open up a new area, 20% of any housing built, even by developers, has to be uh, affordable housing. Uh, so what happens in the, the planning scheme is that uh, the planning uh, regime around a piece of land gets changed. Too often when it gets changed, um, the profit flows straight through to the, the current owner or the future owner without thinking about, well, what's the public benefit that we need to get if we've given a greater form of development? So, for instance, in places like... Um, CBD North, we've just brought out a planning uh, scheme for that, going up Elizabeth Street. 
what would be great would be as you change the planning zone and say, look, you can go from three storeys to five storeys, a certain percentage of that for that uplift factor has to come back as affordable housing. That is one thing that's worked around the world in terms of uh, housing. The other thing is this, uh, the city and a lot of other cities are in fact realising the importance of affordable housing in the inner city. And uh, we've, we've got a couple of projects. One is just finished drill hall at the top by the Queen Victoria Market where we gave an $11 million property to a housing association and they built 54 units and, and refurbished the, the, the drill hall. And we've got another one down on uh, City Road at the Boyd School where we, we've got affordable housing going in. Unfortunately, I don't think enough. Uh, I think we've realised too late the loss when you get uh, just one particular type of housing coming into the city. You've really got to have that spread. And affordability is, I think, one of the big issues. Thank you for that. I, I can tell we're all, we're all heating up because the conversation's heating up a bit and the room's heating up, but I've never seen so many people rock up to an event like this at this hour. So it's amazing to see how many people here really love Melbourne and want to um, digest what the concept of Mega Melbourne means for each of us. Um, but I want to thank our panelists, Jadon, our, our music media mogul, and um, Ellen, our climate activist, and the city designer himself, Rob Adams. And I also want to thank Melbourne Conversations uh, and the TOF for uh, putting on this wonderful event. And thank you to every single one of you for coming out tonight and sharing your thoughts and listening and continue the conversation, buy a drink, um, and thanks again. We'll see you again soon.